And so uh, it's really the the end to end of what I wish I knew, what I really learned from Texas Center for Lifestyle Medicine and developing this practice here and all the struggles I've really had of what that really looked like. And it's really a shortcut into sort of a mentality of uh, what I think health should really be like if the physicians were in control. So that's what that is. Paging Dr. Cook. Paging Dr. Cook. Dr. Cook, you're wanted in the OR. Dr. Cook, you're wanted in the OR. Welcome to the Prescription for Success podcast with your host, Dr. Randy Cook. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Prescription for Success. I'm Dr. Randy Cook, your host for the podcast, which is a production of MD Coaches, providing leadership and executive coaching for physicians by physicians. To overcome burnout, transition your career, develop as a leader, or whatever your goal might be, visit MD Coaches on the web at mymdcoaches.com because you're not in this alone. Remember, you can get CME credit through CMFI by listening to this podcast. Just check the show notes to find out how. Well, my guest today has been with us on RX for success in the past. He's a respected thought leader in the field of integrative medicine. He has an online workshop for building a successful integrative medicine practice. And we invited him back to talk with us in more detail about that project. So let's hear my conversation with Dr. Chang Rawan. Welcome to Prescription for Success, everybody. Uh, I'm very excited today because we're giving today's show a little bit of a uh, a different twist. And we're going to do that by going back to visit an old friend uh, Dr. Chang Ruan, welcome back to the show, my friend. Good to talk to you. Thanks very much. Great to talk to you. And, and I will uh, go ahead and give myself a shame, shameless plug before I get into your shameless plug, and that is I would encourage our listeners who haven't heard the interview that I did with you, I don't remember how long ago it was, but I know that it was episode number 72. Uh, you can learn a great deal about Dr. Juan and uh, the origins of his interest in integrative medicine uh, and that conversation. And I encourage you to take advantage of that if you will. But today we're just going to talk about some fresh things. Uh, Chang, I know that you're very excited to be in the midst. I, I guess it's fair to say you're in the midst of the launch of Integrative Practice Builder. It's actually been underway about five months. You want to start with definitions? What's that all about? Yeah, let's talk about that for a second. You know, I think um, whenever we're inspired to do something and we go all in, you know it's the right thing to do when you're just kind of working tirelessly, but you, you still end up with a lot of energy at the end. And so this is one of those things, you know. And I'm sure the people listening to this, you always felt about that, about something in your life, something that gets the juices going. So the integrative practice builder is um, not just integrative medicine, but it's for people who want to integrate their values into the practice of medicine, right? And that's the definition of integrating integrative medicine. It's not a style of medicine. It's what values can we uh, give to our patients as practitioners? What juices us up? What are we passionate about? And how do you integrate that? from a creative side into your actual clinical practice. I'll give you examples. So me personally, I'm very much into neuropsych, uh, into mindset, into mindfulness and meditation and breathing. And so that's just something that's part of my culture. I'm a Buddhist. That's part of my culture. And um, while I don't teach religion, I do teach the methodology in which we can utilize that for physiologic benefit to the patient's. So, you know, majority of my practice is now focused more on neuropsychiatry, even though I'm uh, internal medicine uh, board certified. And so that's just an example. Hey, I want to integrate the things that I care about, that I do myself. uh, And and how do we how do we how do we funnel that into business structures? 
And that's what integrative medicine really is. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And I'm interested, and again, to restate for the audience, uh, you're actually trained as an internist. What you're doing now is, uh, although, uh, and you can correct me if I'm misrepresenting you here, but I think it's certainly correlated to internal medicine, but yet it has some substantial differences. Uh, And I'm wondering... um, when you knew that's where you wanted to go, where where did you spot the motivation? When when how did you know that it was time to do something different? Can you tell us about that that personal experience at all? Yeah. So my mother is an acupuncturist and herbalist. Uh, my dad he's an MD PhD. He's more on the science side of things. So I've always been integrated growing up, and so the the direction uh, was always there. The, the value was always there to, uh, to create that sort of bridge uh, between the worlds. The, there's several aha moments, I think, in my life that um, allowed me to kind of progress in this path and doing the things that I'm doing. And one of them is recognizing that um, medicine is a bit over-labeled, <laughs> you know, um, whether it's internal medicine or neurology or something like that, there's a lot of labeling that's associated, and that that you know has its own group of values that 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 doctors have. And I, I never realized that until you know I got into you know four years into clinical practice, and just doing your internal medicine stuff, inpatient, outpatient, hospice, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that I realized that. You know, when people talk to me, especially when patients talk to me, um, they don't really expect me to say the things that I say. You know, if someone comes into the to the office, I don't really say, hey, how can I help you? I was like, you know, how would you like me to help you on your journey today? You know, and it kind of throws them off a little bit. And they just look at me like, huh, no one's asked me that before. And uh, what's great is that it creates a sort of subconscious process where the patients become their own heroes. They're not expecting me to be their hero, right? And that creates a very large and meaningful conversation that I've always really had. Um, but the way that medicine sits right now, the way that's designed right now, is not necessarily designed for that level of conversation and then what that opens up to. Um, until very recently, really, probably 2021 is the first time, based on the new uh, CPT reimbursement changes, and we're we're going uh, from from a value-based uh, care model, uh, sorry, from a volume-based care model to a value-based care model, and also just insurance reimbursement in general. It's A lot of it's changed over, uh, and the biggest change was 2021. So I, I see a bright light. So we're, we're stepping into this age, and, and that's starting in radiology, by the way. So we're stepping into this age where there's a lot of changes happening that's faster than what's taught in medical school residency and fellowship. Well, it's a, it's about time somebody started thinking that way because, um, you know, I had a career of forty four years in practice, and things were always happening faster than we could uh, actually uh, bring them into our into our own practice. Uh, I actually, I, I remember uh, speaking of your last interview. I talked a little bit about how we talked about type 2 diabetes uh, back in the, oh, when was I there, in the mid-70s, uh, and it didn't actually have that name. We didn't really know that it was uh, something totally different from uh, what we had recognized as diabetes. And so what you're telling me is that this is not uh, a recognition so much of a pathologic or a change in the way we see pathology or physiology. It's a, the way we deliver the ser- service. Am I getting close? Yeah, I think we're going back in time, actually. Before there was an FDA, before there were, were a lot of bureaucracy, you know, there was a doctor and a patient. And um, every doctor is a holistic doctor. You know, <laughs> we kind of go back in time, right? And just seeing my, my, my grandfather and, uh, and the people that I saw in the past, it's just like, you know, medicine has changed. It has become so systematic. And it, look at, let's look at electronic medical records, right? 
these are data mining tools that have completely changed the way that we practice medicine. There's a lot of policing that's there that's corrupted the uh, the communication between the doctor and the patient just because of what um, we thought was valuable. And so if you look at outcomes, for example, right? So patient outcomes, which is what I always like to, to stand on. The, the patients with the best outcomes are the ones with the most touch points or the most communications, right? And that's true for anyone with, you know, metastatic lung cancer, and they have a lot more touch points, for example, and they're a hospice. And lo and behold, they actually live longer than those people who go into aggressive uh, care and, and some types of cancers, right? We see those people with um, concussive injuries and traumatic brain injuries and military vets. Well, guess uh, which population uh, is the least likely to commit suicide as a patient with the most number of touch points, right? So it's all about communication and touch points. And what we're starting to realize is that the way that we communicate with each other and with patients is what actually drives the outcomes more than the medicines do. So, I mean, that's not surprising. Um, and that's if I were to talk to, you know, my grandpa in the 1950s and he's like, duh, <laughs> yeah, that's that's of course, you know. And so the, the humanistic uh, side of medicine I think it's um, we, we value it less because, you know, me, I, you know, me training in medical school and residency, our value was clinical outcomes uh, in terms of numbers, in terms of mortality and morbidity. But what about the quality of life and what about, you know, patient autonomy, right? And choices that are there, right? And so that's what really dug me really deep into the integrative practice side. And I think that, you know, sharing that with the world is something that um, I'm, I, I really cherish. Attention healthcare professionals. Have you lost control of your career? Do you feel like you need to hit the reset button? If you're tired of uncertainty, struggling to find balance in your career, frustrated with pay cuts, extended shifts, or insurance aggravation, well then, it's time for you to change your life and carve out the career of your dreams. Join Dr. Jarrett Patton and others at Licensed to Live, the conference, July 8 through 10, 2022, live from the Bellevue in Philadelphia. Explore the vast possibilities available to you as a physician or healthcare executive and ignite your career into the life you desire. Hear from expert healthcare professionals as they offer actionable, dynamic, and inspirational information and get ready to leave inspired ready to create the career you love, licensed to live. It's time for you to be happy. And as an added benefit, all attendees become subscribers to receive the print copy of Physician Outlook magazine. For early bird reservations, go to rxforsuccesspodcast.com forward slash live. I don't know if you did it purposely or not, but you have invited me uh, an area of deep, philo- deep philosophic discussion. I hope you're ready to go there. Now, y- you mentioned uh, that the way that the medical record changed, and uh, it, it made me think of, again, my own experience and my earliest experiences as a medical student. Uh, I remember many, many late nights, the middle of the night when uh, n- there was – Nothing to interrupt me. There was no conference to attend, you know, no presentation to give. It was just me trying to work up a patient. And one of the way that you, one of the ways that you did that, uh, a long, long time ago in a world far, far away, uh, was to uh, go down to the medical records department and ask the clerk to give you the records on a particular patient. And I discovered that. Um, Within those medical records, there would be dictated uh, history and physical operative summaries, uh, consultation reports, and other communications that had been dictated in plain English uh, into the medical record. And frankly, I think that I learned much more from reading those um, dictated notes, many of which were dictated by uh, the greats of the eras before me, the Tinsley Harrisons and uh, the Champ Lions and, and, and people of that sort. Um, I don't think that that kind of record keeping 
well, I know that that kind of record keeping doesn't exist anymore, but I don't think there is a way for current day uh, medical students and uh, residents to have that experience. Uh, do, do you think that we'll ever have that again? Will, will we will we record thoughts uh, in a way that we can uh, go back and see how people thought many years before us or not? A- absolutely. So what you're talking about is a lo- looking at dictations and, and the thought process that comes rather than looking at a pre-template format that you can just drag into a template and, and you know, write out some structure of fields, right? It's almost mathematical, you know, it's, it's left brain instead of right brain, right? And so, and so we're seeing a lot of that because of the medical record, you know, templates are, are I mean, they are important uh, because they do save time, but at the same time, it takes out the, the actual linear thought process that really occurs. Now, you know, you have hospital systems who have physician dictations, which I used to do uh, inpatient. And now you have scribes that can do it as an outpatient. So I think we are getting to that. And then we actually use an artificial intelligence platform uh, called DeepScribe, where it translates the conversation between me and the patient. I mean, the robot's listening to us and it's writing out in a uh, uh, NLP format, uh, natural natural language processing format onto the actual note. And so we're, we're getting there. But it's it's costly, right? It's it's very expensive to do, and especially practicing integrative medicine, where if someone is coming in and we're talking about medical stuff, but hey, if their spouse passed away, if they have something family in, in their lives, I want that to be captured as well, and I want to relate that to how that has translated into their physical health, right? Yeah. So these are called biosocial factors. Sorry, biopsychosocial social factors. So the word biopsychosocial, I didn't make up. Um, it's actually in the language of, of CMS, you know, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And yes, and it's uh, it's in the language of CPT codes. There's actually reimbursable CPT codes that uh, now are designated to tease out these biosocial cycle factors. How about that? And and you know what? No one knows about them, right? But they exist, bec- and the reason that they exist is because they used to exist in neuropsychiatry, but now they exist within primary care and other medical specialties, orthopedics and pain management. But are people utilizing these CPT codes? And the answer is no, it's because no one's formally educated them on any of this stuff. Uh, So the obsession here is, Hey, you want to be a good doctor. You're probably already practicing in a way where these CPT codes already describe what you do. And, um, you just have to be able to document and, and bill for them. And so that's, that's, a, that's an art as much as, as it is a science to, uh, to examine this. You know, when we started engineering our CPT workflows in 2017, there wasn't as many as it is right now. But, you know, I, I dove so deep into uh, how these codes were, were uh, created and how is it supposed to be utilized and the gray areas that are here and there uh, that I realized that there's, there's not consistency. There's no consistent way of telling the entire United States, all the doctors in the U S Hey, we got this going on now. And, and even if they, even if there was, even if there's like a press release, which there isn't uh, the language is so like intellectual that it's lost on people, you know? Uh, so, so, there's no bridge there. And I wanted to be that bridge. It's like, Hey, you know what? There's CP, CPT goes out right now that if you call a patient about a result the next day, okay, that's, that's reimbursable, you know, bill for your phone calls. If, uh, if you are sending a patient a text message or an email, right. And you're spending a lot of time of it over, over the last seven days, all your conglomerate time over the last seven days is billable. Now, if patient sends you a picture of their foot and ask you, doc, is this an ulcer, right? That picture is billable as well as their text message. So that's two billable CPT codes. So the the problem here is, is that a lot has changed in the last few years, especially in 2021 to 2022, that allows for that communication to be reimbursed. And, you know, money really drives behavior. So if we're able to change the way 
that we want to practice medicine based on the way that we do it, we have to know, you know, what are we going to get paid for? Right. And so from, yeah. So from a revenue side, dollar for dollar, it's actually more profitable to have short phone calls with patients. Right. And then just schedule that for an entire day, you know, and it's more convenient for the patients, more convenient for you. You don't have to burden your staff. Uh, then seeing the patients in person on the E&M visit, significantly more profitable, right? And so, and so now I was like, wow, we got this technology. We got this thing called a phone. <laughs> we have text messaging. We have emails. We have secure messaging. All these things are actually reimbursable. Now, what does, and let's say if you and I are collaborating on a patient and the patient's not involved, and I was like, hey, Randy, you got this patient here. I want to work with you on. And our conversation is billable on your side and my side. Uh, my, my note to you that I present to you is actually billable by itself as well. So all these are actually brand new. And the idea of integrative health is just more communication, more communication with the other caregivers of the patient. Oh, and also our conversation with the patient's families, even if the patient's not there, it's also have new billable CPT codes there as well. And so... We are starting to see that there is already a stru- uh, engineering structure of communication within the United States that we are that is already there. Not only do we need to take advantage of it, we have to do the patient uh, a due diligence to investigate that and then incorporate it into what we think how medicine should be practiced. Which is something that I think has been missing, uh, and y- y- you know. Uh, it was, it was my generation that was there when the electronic medical record first appeared. And I will tell you, quite frankly, I thought it was going to be the greatest thing that ever came along. But when the final product became avail- became available, uh, it simply was not because it was too difficult to operate. And you knew that, uh, you know, you could get a level five examination by claiming that you did all the things, you know, the family history, the medication history and all those kind of things, but you didn't necessarily have to put uh, a lot of information in there. And, and what I hear you saying, uh, and I hope this is what I heard is that there is actually a uh, reason to believe that the technology has actually um, advanced to the point where you will be rewarded for taking the time to make those things happen. Is this true? It, it is true. Let's take an example of what you said right here, right? Is the EMR the greatest thing that ever that ever was developed? The answer is yes, just not for doctors. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it, it's it's not just that, but you know, data is worth more than than patients' lives, uh, unfortunately, when it comes to corporations and institutions, right? Whoever holds the data holds the key. And then uh, and then companies can decide what, whatever they want to use with that particular data. E- EMR shifted the power from the physicians to the, to uh, to other other corporations drastically because it used to be that the physicians held the data. Now the EMR holds the actual data. And because things are on cloud and stuff like that, we, they can go in and look at all sorts of different population and population data. So it's a lot of power to kind of play with, right? You know, is it is it detrimental for like the physician patient relationship? Yeah. And it's because a lot of doctors, including myself in my earlier days, I had to type. I can't look my patient in the eyes as they were telling me stuff. And uh, and there's no way they can capture all of that information uh, after the 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 uh, the visits over at the end of the day. You know, especially like my wife's an OBGYN. You know, there's uh, there's a lot of information to really capture there. And it's really hard to do so in just a few minutes. Right. Um, so, and then came this whole thing on templates. Oh, templates are great. Well, templates were designed to capture, uh, uh, enough information to build out a specific code. Right. And, and so, um, now you have all these companies that have preset templates. Oh, this is your 99214 template. This is your 99213 template. This is your 99215 template. Right. And so, um, which by the way, also went out the window in 2021 because the criteria is completely different now. Uh, so, you, so all these templates came from uh, from the practice of medicine in terms of like the business of of of, of medicine, but it still created a lot of detriment to the conversation between the the physician and the patient. 
So who suffers? The patients suffer, the doctors suffer, the administrators suffer, the medical assistants suffer because they can't, because all your, all your notes look the same, right? You can't tell who, what's doing what. Uh, and so all the systems suffer uh, pretty drastically. And then and not only that, you're not really capturing valuable data, you know? The, to create that change, we have to not work against the system, but work with what's already been developed. You know, you know, uh, last year on the Physician Practice Automation Summit that, that I interviewed you on, I interviewed Haley Fisher Wright, who was uh, the CEO of uh, MGMA, who was responsible for getting these CPT codes approved for telecommunication. But did anybody know about it? No, not really. <laughs> you know. Uh, you know, and I, and I still, to this day, I was talking to ophthalmologist or yeah, ophthalmologist this morning and I'm like, Hey, did you know? And, and he, 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 uh, he's the lead ophthalmologist is a hundred uh, ophthalmology group, a huge group. It's like, did you know that if I, if we actually chat about a patient for five minutes and you actually give me a console note, you can actually bill for it. That just blew his mind. Right. I was like, Hey, did you know that if someone has an abnormal exam, you call them because of the abnormal exam? Right? Did you know that your doctors can actually bill for it? That blew his mind even more. And then from a hundred ophthalmology practice, you know that translates into seven figures of, of lost revenue that they didn't know that can they can capture of things that already went into play back in 2017 and it's 2022. Right? So, so this is what we have to get kind of hyper focused on: is engineering medicine the way that we want to practice as doctors, giving pa- back the power to the doctors. But understanding how the system, you know, actually works uh, and creating change from that level instead of trying to, you know, fight everything. Because it kind of hurts me to see a lot of doctors exit the insurance system because uh, a lot of the people on Medicaid, Medicare do need that same high level of services. And so it's it it's, um, you know, I understand why people leave the insurance system, um, but there's also another way. And so Integrative Practice Builder uh, if you can't tell, is all about how do you integrate your values into the insurance-based uh, system and practicing medicine. Hi, I'm Rhonda Crow, founder and CEO for MD Coaches. Here on RX for Success, we interview a lot of great medical professionals on how they grew their careers, how they overcame challenges, and how they handle day-to-day work. I really hope you're getting a lot of great information But if you're looking for an answer to a specific problem, management or administration challenge, or if you're feeling just a a bit burnt out, like maybe you chose the wrong career, well, then there's a faster way to get the help you need. No, it's not counseling. It's coaching. Rx for Success is produced by MD Coaches, a team of physicians who have been where you are. I know you're used to going it alone, but you don't have to. Get the support you need today. Visit us at mymdcoaches.com to schedule your complimentary consultation. Again, that's mymdcoaches.com because you're not in this alone. We'll get back to our interview in just a moment. But right now, I want to tell you a little bit about Physician Outlook. If you haven't discovered this remarkable magazine, please do so very soon. It was created by physicians for physicians to showcase the intersection between clinical and non-clinical interests, whether it's writing, painting, cooking, politics, and dozens of other topics. Physician Outlook gives a physician perspective. It's available online and in print. It's really unique among physician lifestyle magazines. And like the Prescription for Success podcast, Physician Outlook amplifies the voice of any physician who has something to say. It also engages patients who still believe in physician-led, team-based care. And Prescription for Success listeners can get three months free when you enter our promo code rx for success and select the monthly option at checkout. That's a really great deal on this stunning publication. And now let's get back to today's interview. To, to expand the discussion just a little bit more, I want to ask you, do you think this uh, intrusion of the, of the electronic medical record as we now know it into a previously fairly intimate communication between doctor and patient uh, that got lost 
I think. Um, is that what is that what made us burned out? No, <laughs> I think that's part of it, right? Uh, let's talk about burnout for a second. Burnout is um, basically having much higher expectations <laughs> and, and not fulfilling them over a long period of time. That's sort of my definition of of, of burnout. It's also the same definition for depression. <laughs> so it's uh, yeah, it's expectations minus reality in, in the way that we perceive reality. So let's talk about what the promise was, what the deliverables were uh, when it comes to medical education. The deliverables were that you become a doctor or a nurse practitioner or PA, wh- whichever one you are in the healthcare field. You become this sort of provider and then you exist to serve the patients and that gives you fulfillment, right? So that's the promise, <laughs> you know. Uh, you see that on TV and media and social media and stuff like that, right? The reality, uh, it, and if, you know, the pandemic didn't accelerate that hundredfold, I don't know what else would have, is that um, most people are getting their value uh, in health, not from doctors. You know, an 18-year-old uh, TikTok influencer has way more clout than doctors do at this point. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a very different day and age. And so, you know, I'll give you an example is we had a, there's a 21 year old that was on YouTube talking about her journey with, uh, with, 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 with Crohn's disease and, uh, and all sorts of very like misleading information because it just because it pertains to her doesn't necessarily mean it pertains to like everyone. Right. And, uh, and so, and so I'm like, wow, you know, the information is there. And as an integrative practice uh, uh, specialist and being trained in like integrative and functional medicine, you know, the the influencers are the people to really compete with with a lot of information. Now, I don't call it misinformation. I just call it information because I actually don't believe there's any such a thing as misinformation because information is how we perceive it. Now, this girl, she's 21. She's doing great because she's sharing her story with the world, which is which is a lot to applaud. Um, but if people take it as a universal advice, then that's not going to be the greatest thing. And the reason I mentioned that is because this morning I opened up my secure message and lo and behold, <laughs> one of my patients, uh, quoted this, uh, this, this girl and actually sent me the link. What do you think about this? Should I do X, Y, and Z? Uh, and so, so the, the promise, the deliverables of medicine is that you'll be the one taking care of the patient. But when it comes down to it, you're also battling against other things that are out there, right? And so, and so while the EMR has a big contribution, I think the way that we receive information now has a much larger contribution. Um, but here's the cool part, Randy. Here's the cool part. There's ways of addressing this that can create an even higher amount of value for the patient uh, as long as the communication uh, is there, right? And uh, and we're not taught to communicate <laughs> in med school and residency. We're really not. Well, let's talk about where integrative practice builder fits into all this. Who who needs it, and where do they find it? A while ago, I decided to take the word "need" out of my vocabulary and replace it with "want." So, who would want something like this? So, it's a doctor who's really had enough. Who understands that there's more to medicine than quitting it. Uh, There's more to taking insurance than quitting that. And it's the people who are really looking for a transition of some sort and not necessarily of a career, but transition of a mindset, right? So um, there's different sections on the integrative practice builder. Um, My my favorite one is called a psychology of business. You know, I call it (laughs) MBA-ish. So, yeah, it's about like how do you how do you have how do you reverse a lot of what's taught to us in med school and think like a like a business person, but the deliverable is create an enormous amount of value for the patients, right? How do you like 10x the value for, you have for your patients and and then create a business out of it? And so uh, there's a lot of marketing in there as well because I used to own a marketing company. That's just my background. Uh, and then, and then another one is on special operations from a team leadership standpoint. How do you, uh, how do you develop the best company culture? How do you create leaders within your organization? So you're not burnt out all the time. 
how do you not be the smartest person in a room during your morning, morning huddles? Right. And so, um, and then, and I have some things that are a little more specific or a lot more specific, like how do you integrate the new taxonomy of health coaches into your practice? Uh, how do you do one on many visits or we call group visits or share medical visits and billing uh, that's associated with it. And so uh, it's really the, the end to end of what I wish I knew and what I really learned from Texas Center for Lifestyle Medicine and developing this practice here. And all the struggles I've really had of what that really looked like. And it's really a shortcut into sort of a mentality of uh, what I think health should really be like if the physicians were in control. So that's what that is. Boy, that sounds like Shangri-La right there, the physicians in control. So uh, if somebody is interested and they want to get involved in this, uh, how, how do they access the integrative practice builder and what are, what are they likely to experience? Yeah. So, um, you know, uh, I, I asked your administrator to share the link uh, you know, with this, with this uh, podcast. Yeah. So go ahead and, and click on it in, in the show notes and that'll take you to a page where it's all me. <laughs> You'll see me in my raw form and then you can access it, you know, right away. These are pre-recorded videos and it's really long and it's CME by the way as well. So, um, so go, yeah, it's big plus. So a lot of you physicians who are employed who have allocations for CME funds uh, can actually utilize that on here. And so it's, um, it's instant access and um, what I want people to get out of it um, is the fact that there's just so much more um, to medicine and, and to life and finding the joy in medicine uh, requires a big change in mentality. And that's the primary focus of, uh, of integrated practice builder. So yes, it's business, but more importantly, it's, it's, it's reducing burnout. We're actually letting go of burnout and it's leadership and it's developing the most meaningful relationships that you can imagine. In fact, the very first video that you guys see is me and my, my, my seven year old daughter <laughs> talking. And, uh, and, and that's, that's the type of atmosphere that I really want people to, to have. I love the tagline. Uh, it turns, I'm probably not quoting you precisely, but uh, as, as I've scribbled in my notes, you say the uh, integrative practice builder turns docs into integrative medicine rock stars. That's pretty, that's pretty exciting. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Rock stars. Yeah. And I like to use those words because, you know, um, what we have to do is we have to play, you know, there's a great book called Essentialism, and I think it's chapter four. No, chapter seven, I think, that talks about one of the most essential things that we have in our life, other than like having food, water, shelter, is actually play, right? And uh, if we can create that play as an essentialist part of our lives, which we're trained not to do as physicians, then we can be rock stars. <laughs> so that's how I came up with that. So true. Very wise. Well, Dr. Cheng Wan, the founder of Texas Center for Lifestyle Medicine and now the founder of Integrative Practice Builder. As usual, it's been a fascinating conversation, and I really do appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. And to our audience, uh, I hope you will take the opportunity to uh, check out the Integrative Practice Builder website and learn more. And uh, we've got more information for you in our show notes, of course. And if you haven't heard my prior conversation, episode number 72 with uh, Dr. Chang Ruan, uh, I think it's a pretty good little chit chat and I would recommend that to you as well. So Chang, thanks again for being with us. It's been a pleasure as always. Thank you so much for joining us today. We would really appreciate a review from you, and a five-star rating helps us a lot. The ratings help give our show more visibility, and they help us reach more listeners. To be sure you never miss another episode, visit our website at rxforsuccesspodcast.com to subscribe. You can even earn CME credit with CMFI just by listening. Also, you can access membership-only material through our Patreon page, including... Rapid-fire Q&A sessions with our guests. 
Special thanks to Ryan Jones, who created and performs our theme music for the show. And remember, be sure to fill your prescription for success with my next episode.